Sam, we're at the fish hatchery here, and right now I am looking at a wide variety of sturgeon. I mean, if you walked in here, you wouldn't realize sturgeon are so endangered in the Missouri River chain, but they are, right? They definitely are. They're, they're a fish that's, we're talking about the pallid sturgeon here, okay. a species of fish found only in the Missouri River drainage and part of the lower Mississippi. Only place on earth they're found, and we happen to be a fish hatchery that specializes in conser conserving this species. We've been raising these fish for about 21 years. Um, in doing so, we've slowed the, the disappearance of this species from the earth. And you've got a backup plan, a reserve in place. We're in front of this tank here, and there's, I, there's a bunch of tanks here, and you're actually saving these. It reminds me of the way the seeds work, and uh, I forgot what cold climate it is, but they store all the seeds, so if there should be some big fallout, we have the seeds in the backup plan, and that's basically what this is, is a backup plan for sturgeon, so that if all of them should go away, you've got these species here with a wide variety of uh, uh, genes inside them. Now, how did you do that? How, what's that process like? Yeah, we're, we're in our captive broodstock building. Okay. Every fish in here, and there's a couple thousand, every one of them was hatched here at this hatchery over the last 21 years. Every year when we make a batch of these fish, we keep a few from each family, and a family would be a mother and a father. From each family, we keep a few, and they spend their whole lives with us in this building. They're like the backup reserve plan. Exactly. In a worst case scenario, if the wild population were to go extinct, we have several thousand fish here to rebuild from. Uh, but more likely and more often, these fish are used for all sorts of research projects that help us learn about this species. Now when you say keep a few, what happens to the other ones? The rest are stocked or released into the Missouri River. Okay. From Montana to St. Louis, uh, fish from this hatchery are spread out over you know, the entire length of the river and uh, in hopes of restoring that population of this rare fish that just has it's been on the earth forever but in the last 50, 100 years, their numbers have just disappeared, mostly due to habitat issues. Okay. Now you've got, it seems like to me, a three-prong approach here for these sturgeon. You're breeding them to release them to get the numbers back up in the Missouri chain, but you're also sa saving some as a resource for backup, and then also the hatchery itself acts as a uh, outreach or a learning program for a lot of people. Absolutely, we, we do all of that, and uh, Particularly my job as a biologist, I spend a lot of my time on the outreach side of that. It's so important that we get our message out, you know, that people understand what we do here, why we do it, why it's important to save a species like this, or why it's important to produce more game fish. People uh, go their whole lives and have no idea that this even exists. That's right. You know I mean, they got no that's clue right. that the hatchery is there. And the most important part is the funding in order to keep stuff like this going. If your guys just didn't, let's say you didn't have any funding, the lights get shut off, all these sturgeon, some of them you've had here for over 20 years, what happens to them? So how are you guys funded so that doesn't happen? Well, we have multiple funding sources at this hatchery. Um, some of the funding for our paddlefish and sturgeon comes from the Army Corps of Engineers, who manages the Missouri River, okay. and who you know, engineered the changes in the river that caused some issues for some of these species and that, and they put money back into mitigating those losses and they help pay for things like this. We, we get a lot of uh, appropriated general funds, so to speak, basically taxpayer dollars okay. that are spent on fish and wildlife conservation. But if that's not there and people aren't getting into fishing and aren't buying fishing licenses and aren't being educated, the future is pretty bleak for all of us. Yeah, essentially, if if America just stops caring about our fish and wildlife, you know, if, if that is just lost, and there's concerns about that as our younger generations spend less and less time outside. You betcha. Things like this, things like, like producing walleye or uh, whatever it might be, they can go by the wayside. It's not a given. You know, right. Priorities yeah. can change, and if there's no one there to speak up for our fish and wildlife, you know, things can really go downhill. It's kind of the mission of our show is to educate people like that. And I've often said that hunters and fishermen treat the fish like a resource because it is a resource to us, whether it's harvesting it for food or just harvesting the, the enjoyment of catching fish or whatever right. it might be. And once the, the, the value of that resource is gone to hunters and fishermen, 
no one has the value to spend the dollars that we do to keep them there. And that's been proven over time because that's where the funding comes from. And that's a scary thought. So if we don't get more fishermen, we're in big trouble. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you buy a fishing license and that money goes to the particular state you're fishing in. That state can then turn and use that fishing license money to reach into a larger pool of money that's collected from the tax you pay on fishing gear, on boat gas, things like that, that comes from the federal government. And uh, it magnifies the spending power for the state. What's the biggest threat to this fish and paddlefish in the Missouri River chain? The biggest threat to pallid sturgeon, it all comes down to habitat. This is a very specialized fish. Some fish are, are generalists, like a bluegill or a bass. They can, can live, live anywhere. About anywhere. But these are the opposite. They evolved in a big river system. They need a basically a shallow, muddy river that is allowed to have some room to, to move from bank to bank that floods once in a while. Suck up some fish. Gets low, yeah. And they, they're just not a, a species that has been able to evolve to deal with the modern Missouri. Now what about the paddlefish? Paddlefish, much less so, face the same problems, particularly with the reservoirs on the Missouri. Uh, the Missouri River reservoirs, like we have in South Dakota and North Dakota, will grow some amazing giant paddlefish. But in the case of South Dakota's reservoirs, they really can't reproduce there. They need the big, long, flowing river. So the paddlefish we produce at this hatchery, we stock into the reservoirs upstream of, of our facility, where the fish will grow very well. They may not be able to reproduce, but we've been able to create some excellent sport fishing opportunities doing that. So people can then pay for the licenses to help the fishery and do more, more good than harm, and then maybe get one fish if they get pulled for a tag. And then, but that one fish they catch, the dollars that they spent to get that tag does a lot more good than just one paddlefish. That's right, and it, and it goes to the larger picture of just keeping people engaged. And Keeps giving the value to the, to exactly. the, to the fish itself. Yes. Now, what, what, um, for, as far as sport fishing goes, bass, and other species and things like that. What's the biggest threat in the Missouri River for those guys? Well, the Missouri River is a walleye fishery. Okay. I mean, if you were to think about what the Dakotas I know portion for. of the Missouri is, it's all about walleye. Which is good eating. Yes, and walleye tend to come and go based on weather conditions in a lot of cases. Um, you get several years of good weather, the right kind of flows and things, you can have great walleye fishing. Uh, They've adapted very well to the reservoirs okay. in contrast to the sturgeon. Right. So the reservoirs are, are certainly not all bad. They've done some amazing things for sport fishing, walleye, northern pike, occasionally black crappie, smallmouth bass. Uh, they like that still water, the rocky shores you get with the Missouris. Uh, it's amazing for that type of fishing. And we're glad to be able to uh, contribute walleye in particular to that fishery right here in South Dakota. What's your thought on the uh, um, on the invasives going on with the Asian carp deal? Uh, invasive species are a hot topic in, in South Dakota right now. We're a little behind other areas of the country, fortunately, when it comes to Asian carp and zebra mussels. But both of those have arrived right here in the Yankton, South Dakota area. Zebra mussels showed up about five years ago. Little invasive mollusks or, uh, yeah. from Europe. I and, stepped on them and cut my foot pretty good. Oh, they are sharp. They're a big problem. Uh, they're a huge, costly problem whether you fish or not because of the way they like to get in pipes, into infrastructure. Anything that draws water out of a zebra mussel lake is going to struggle with them getting into the pipes, clogging them up. Uh, we are extremely careful with zebra mussels at this hatchery because we use water from a zebra mussel lake, and we've found excellent ways to keep them out. But uh, the key is slow the spread of all these species. It's extremely hard to ever get rid of them and probably unlikely in the case of Asian carp or zebra mussels. So the best thing we can do is slow down their spread, stop it if we can. And a big part of that is just getting the word out about the negative effects of these things and, and how they're spread. Well, thank you so much for showing us around and giving us that valuable information. Hopefully, us fishing will be able to knock some of those guys out that are messing up everything. So. All right. We appreciate everything you do to spread the word about conservation. Thank you.